My name is Bill W. and I'm an alcoholic. A time like this, I wish my partner could be here. As you listen to my story, you'll see how for all those years before we met, it was like he and I were linked together by an invisible thread. I'm talking about the man we all call Dr. Bob, alcoholic. Good to be here sober. I grew up in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. That's about 90 miles from where Bill W. was born and raised. It's a good state to come from if you want to start a program for drunks, Vermont. My parents divorced when I was nine. I was left with my grandfather, Fayette. One day, Graham says, nobody but an Australian can make it through a boomerang. Oh yeah, well, I'll be the first American. I tried and tried, good luck. Then one day, I saw a piece of wood out of the headboard of my bed, whittled it down, damn thing almost hit the old geezer in the back of the head. <laughs> By the age of 15, I had made three vows. Number one, to be number one in anything. Anything I did was no use. I was forced by mother to attend church four times a week, and I took a vow that when I got free, I would never darken the doors of the church again. A vow I kept religiously for 40 odd years. My second vow was that one day I'd be accepted at the members only Mount Equinox Resort, where I met my beautiful wife Lois, one of the rich summer folk from New York City. In 1898, I left home for Dartmouth College, where I met my Annie, a Wellesley College girl from Illinois. Drink soon cured my shyness. My final vow is about booze. After a, after a whirlwind courtship lasting 17 years, I finally married Annie, set up surgery in Akron, Ohio, and I said to my wife, all I want now is to be normal. Just a normal surgeon with a normal family in normal Akron, Ohio. And on my tombstone I want dead, which is normal. See, I had heard what booze had done to my grandfather. Seen what it's done to my father. I vowed it would never happen to me. Say, can I use the phone? If you can pay for it. Where am I? Egypt. Pennsylvania. <laughs> Operator, I want to place a call to New York City. Big low 73434. Mr. Frank Shaw from Bill Wilson. Reverse the charges. Here's the patch kit, honey. See if you can fix the rip in the tent. Chance was mistaken. Mira? How much is your cheapest room? Two bucks. Sorry, Lou. Oh, maybe our big adventure is over, Bill. This riding in the sidecar in the rain is not my ideal fun. Come on, this is jazzy. Oh, <laughs> let's go back to New York. We've had a slight snag, that's all. It's more than that. What? What's the matter? Last night. Yeah? Remember? Remember what? You stood up singing, the bombs bursting in air, you put your fist right through that tent and in poured the rain. So that's how the tent got ripped. Yeah, and then we had a serious talk. Okay, okay, what did I say? You said it would be the last time. Listen, from now on, I mean, getting me out of New York's work so far, mostly. No. Frank, we're in Egypt, Pennsylvania. I took a job as a night watchman at the Portland cement plant. They're making cement for less than a dollar a barrel. Way down the line it cost. The stock's dawdling at 15. I figure it's worth 25 at least. If I were you, I'd buy the hell out of it. You what? 5,000 shares and carry me for 100 more? GE went to what? Yeah, I predicted it would. Sure. A line of credit? 10 grand? Actually, we're just a little short on cash right now. 500 will do just fine. Tomorrow we'll toot up the motorcycle and head south to the American Cyanamid, then down to the Carolinas and Georgia. So long, Frank. <laughs> Baby, we're not broke anymore! Yes, God damn it, I knew it would work! <laughs> I'm telling you, these Wall Street guys never get, all, get up off their butts and check out these companies. The scientific analysis of mine is going to revolutionize the whole damn market. Gotcha! It's 1925, the big train's moving, and we're on board. I'm telling you, both of you, this country can do anything. We're number one in the world, right? Right? I, I, I don't have an opinion on that. Follow your best bubbly. No. Well, we gotta celebrate. It's not about the money. Listen, from now on, starting tomorrow. Promise. Sworn on the family Bible. As soon as it dries out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even soaking wet, you look gorgeous. I remember that first summer on Emerald Lake, you and your fancy Abercrombie and Fitch skiff. 
Me and my dumpy town rowboat. With a blanket for a sail. Oh my gosh, you mean I'm sick. Don't you see it? Well, we can make it. I know it. We start a family of our own. Yes, we're on our way. We're making a crossing road together. Henrietta Cyberling, queen of the Goodyear rubber cyberlings, princess of neoprene. Bob! Henrietta is the only creature in Akron, if not all of Ohio, who can ruin Christmas with religion. You know, the country's in the crap. Oh, Bob! There are no jobs, there's no money, families are falling apart, and she keeps getting messages about me from God. Let's go. <laughs> oh, oh, ow! Are you all right? Oh, yeah, it's, it's those pains in the old bread basket again. It's like, it feels like a blast furnace down there. Oh, oh. Is it the hospital again or the sanitarium? Oh, no, 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 it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I have to stay and look after you. Oh, no, no need, Annie. You go ahead. I, I just need to spend the evening dousing myself with milk and bicarb pills. I'll be fine. Truth is, I'm kind of nervous about tomorrow, you know, being all thumbs and surgery. How can you still doubt yourself after all these years? Well, you know, I like the fellow sitting around the hardware store. Farmer comes in and asks if he wants to work the harvest. How much you paying, the man asks. I'm paying, says the farmer, whatever you're worth. <laughs> no thanks, says the fellow. I'll be damned if I work for that little. <laughs> <laughs> so, here we are again. Do I stay or do I go? You go for both of us, Ann. I mean, wonderful institution, the Oxford Group. I heard the other day that Mae West and Harry Truman joined a perfect couple. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to see, I'll see if I can catch the Friday fight and uh, maybe do my hour of reading. What are you reading? What, this? Uh, a fellow named James. The Bible? Philosopher. All right, Robert. This time, I will go. Good night. And? Brooklyn sleeps anymore. Oh, the mattress. I thought it'd be better down here. You writing? My journal. No, please, Lo, don't go. Stay. You need to find work. It's a crash my fault. Don't blame me. Blame that nitwit Herbert Hoover. The crash was five years ago, Bill. You have authors? Joe Hershon called you the, the Einstein of Wall Street. And then he fires me. Wow. You can't sell bonds from a jail cell in Canada, Bill. Drunk the day my mother died. Not there the night I lost our child. Passed out on the streets of Manhattan. And now look at you. You're too afraid to go out at all. If I stayed upstairs another minute, I was going to jump. Why don't you just stop? God damn it, I don't know. Well, the doctor says if you don't, you're going to die within a year. 
You're so cold. It is self-defense. Don't go. Oh, no, not again. Where's my money? Uh, money. That's all you care about anymore, money. Twenty-one fifty for the mortgage and my whole week's pay. Twenty-one fifty. I'm sixty thousand in debt. You stole my money. Mm. Oh, I was gonna wait until morning, but it is morning, and I'm not gonna protect you anymore. The adoption bureau called. They closed our case. It's Sh over. Shit! What? What did they say? Oh, you don't have the decency to die. Mademoiselle from Armentier's parlez vous Mademoiselle from Armentier's, she didn't wear any underwear, inky dinky parlez vous Jesus. What the hell happened to you? Uh, bus collided with a car. It's out of commission. I'll be damned, you hurt. Just a little shipping up. Hey, nice perfume. Thanks. What's that? This flying target rifle, that's going to do some shooting. On Staten Island? He's joking. He's pulling my leg. I ain't, but I like it. <laughs> Better watch it. Okay, I will. <laughs> no, Clay Pigeon's a guy from the middle of the shooting range out here. Say, what's the next bus? I'm trying to get out to the golf course. Half hour anyways. What can I get you? I love scotch and ham and cheese. And what about you, big boy? Mm. Half hour. Ditto the ham and cheese. And a ginger ale. Want to drink? Nope. Religious? Nope. Alcoholic. What's that? Can't drink. If I do, it's wet brain or death within the year. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Tells me it's not a moral failing, it's it's a disease. A disease? Yeah. Like say tuberculosis? Tuberculosis? <laughs> My grandmother died of tuberculosis. Precisely. Cures right in here. Self-knowledge. See, one drink makes you crave another, and then another. Oh, like hay fever. Hay fever. No, not like hay fever. See, I'm allergic. You would not. If I was to take that drink as you were so harmless at you getting ready to do, it would leave me on a total bender. I'd wind up tonight in the gutter, dead to the world. I'd turn into a monster. Goddamn maniac. Jesus Christ almighty. <laughs> <laughs> I know this now. As long as I stay away from that first drink, I'm A-OK. -okay. Oh, that's right. It's Armistice Day. Uh, say, where was you in the wall? France and England. Lieutenant Colonel, heavy artillery. Oh, leader of men. You bet I was. Damn good at it, too. Mm. It's a holiday, boys, and we's celebrating. Boilermakers on the house. Ooh, great. <laughs> All right. So, uh, can you have this one? Why is the holidays, too? Doesn't matter. Not even on a holiday. That's a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I myself was in the Navy during the war, stationed out in Iowa. <laughs> what the hell was the United States Navy doing out in Iowa? Right? Hey! Miss! Uh, another round for me and my friend. Just like Lady Astor. <laughs> hey, my turn. Sorry, pal, you lose. Bye bye. You had your turn, now it's my turn. Hey, it's my Wait, turn! It. My turn! <laughs> Here's the job. 
Japanese sand, man. <laughs> Sinking in with the dew. Does an old second hand man buy your day from you? He will take every sorrow <laughs> of the day that is true. <laughs> and I'll get you tomorrow just to start life anew. I'm the Japanese Sandman, tattoo on my butt. <laughs> tattoos, I'll show you tattoos from my salad days, little lady. Frail. That snake is the serpent from the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and that, what's that? <laughs> How'd I get him? I can't recall. <laughs> but I was on fire. It was a blazer. A real blazer. You know, all I ever wanted was to have curly hair and play the piano and tap dance, and I don't, and I, and I can't, but. <laughs> Go ahead, kill yourself. Uh, oh, good idea. <laughs> November 25th, 1934. Dear President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I am an American, and I fought for freedom. And in my opinion, this new deal of yours is one of the most ridiculous, cockamamie ideas in the history of civilization. Yeah. Afternoon, Bill. Effie Thatcher? I don't believe it. You look A1. Yeah, how are you, friend? Oh, pretty good. <laughs> so what happened to your head? Yeah, it slipped on the ice. What's it been, five years? Let's celebrate it. Gin and pineapple juice. <laughs> Not that I care for the pineapple goddamn juice. <laughs> <laughs> Case Lois suddenly appears. Yeah, where is she? I don't know. Here, have a drink. No thanks, I don't need that stuff anymore. What? You're the biggest drinker I know. <laughs> My friend, something incredible has happened. Can I tell you about it? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. You remember Roland? Yeah. He was worse than me. His father sent him all the way to Switzerland to be treated by Dr. Carl Young. <clears throat> Carl Young? Yeah, he stays there in his clinic for a year. As soon as he gets out, he drinks. Well, here's to him. <laughs> Young told him that further therapy would be useless, that the only thing that would help him would be a vital spiritual awakening. Oh, God. Yeah, so Roland comes back and joins this Christian organization. They don't meet in churches, they meet right in people's houses. The Oxford group, a lot of high-class people. Uh-oh. Those little hairs on the back of my neck are standing up straight. Uh, I know how you feel. One day I find myself in Vermont, in court, about to be locked up again for alcoholic insanity. There standing next to me is Roland, sober. He asked the judge to turn me over to him on the condition that I would come down here and live at the Oxford Group house. The Convery Mission down on 23rd. Yesterday I, I heard about you. What? What did you hear? I heard you're in trouble. Trouble. Everybody's in trouble. I gotta tell you, Bill, I haven't had a drink since that day in court. Two whole months. It's a miracle. I'd like to talk to you about prayer. Holy shit. <laughs> I know. I know. But I did what they told me. I got down on my knees, and it worked. Okay, really. How'd you do it? Oh, I didn't. It was the grace of God. You're talking ragtime now, buddy. The age of miracles has returned. Men are sinners, but they can be saved if they follow the four absolutes, especially absolute humility. Listen, let me tell you something. I'm not an atheist, okay? My father's father, my namesake, he was a fierce drinker. One Sunday morning, he takes himself out the back of the house, up to the top of Mount Ailes. Something happened to him up there. 
He came back down and never took another drink. Eight years till he died. So I believe something can happen to people. But with preachers and prayers and those little goddamn candles they light for dead people. <laughs> well, you're way ahead of where I was. At least you believe in something. Hang on to whatever you believe in. Damn it, you big love. You don't have to believe in God. You just have to admit that you're not God. Let something outside that stubborn Vermont self of yours take hold. Your problem is you want to drink more than you want to live. Look, you're not in my world. I don't share your belief. Good. Good? I didn't believe Roland. Roland didn't believe God. This thing works in spite of any belief. <sighs> Abby, really. Here, take this car. You're my best friend on earth, buddy. Calvary Mission, address is on the car. You're too goddamn late, buddy. I'm gone. I'll see you there, brother. I'll see you there. You there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Shit. This isn't heaven, is it? No, but it isn't hell either. I'm not so sure. Where's Lois? Oh, she'll be back. How long have I been here? Uh, two days. Oh, God. What the hell happened? You don't remember anything? I, I was trying to get to your mission. I got off the subway and I hit a few bars. Started drinking with the guy, a Swede. <laughs> That's it. That's all I can remember. What happened? Oh, well, the two of you came down three times to the mission that afternoon looking for me. That night, I got you to the meeting, sat you down with the newcomers. Oh, God, yeah, that stink of booze and sweat and piss. <laughs> yep, and the preacher called for all those saved by Jesus to come up, and before I could stop you, you walked right up, started talking about salvation, and how'd you turn your life over to God? No, I didn't. Oh, you did. It was very moving. <laughs> My friend, you made your surrender to God. <laughs> it didn't work. I've been drunk ever since. How many days? Four, but at least you made it to Towns Hospital. Oh, yeah. I've been here before. Great menu. Castor oil, cold tomatoes, purge and puke. Leave me alone, Abby. Just get out of here. Phil, so, what do you say we pray together? Get the hell out of here. <laughs> That's the spirit. Tell you what, I'll be praying for you. And I'll be back tomorrow. Damn it, she don't do anything. Anything at all. God damn it. If there's anybody out there, show me, god damn it, show me. Doctor! Dr. Silkworth! Dr. Silkworth! What is it, Bill? Something just happened. Did the lights flash out there? No. In here, the room got all light, all lit up. I was seized with... I felt... I can't... I can't describe it. Keep going. It was like I was on a mountain. The wind was blowing hard all around me, right, right through me. It was strange, kind of like a spirit, right through me. And then I, I heard the words, you are a free man. Was it a voice you heard? Yeah. No, sort of. 
More like a thought. Your own thought? Only in my mind's eye. How tangible was the wind? I don't know. Am I still sane? I believe so. What the hell happened? I'm not sure, Bill. But whatever you've got a hold of, hang on to it. It's better than what had a hold of you a few moments ago. Who asked her to come into my life? Like having the DTs every time I turn around. Henrietta Cyber. When she says the divinity, I want to puke. <laughs> You'd like to speak with Bob yourself? No. Yes. He is a challenge to me. And the divinity, too. <laughs> Bob's come into your life for a purpose? Perhaps. Thanks for calling again, Henrietta. Goodbye. What are you and the poltergeist of the rubber industry? <laughs> Henrietta says she's received guidance from God that you must admit your secret to the group. She's called a special meeting for you to give testimony. Those meetings don't work. Done everything they said. Read scripture. Even tried to pray. Me pray. It doesn't work. And the worst is I gave in. I sacrifice my belief. Your belief? My absolute belief in non-belief. <laughs> Those evangelicals are getting on my nerves. They're always so goddamn happy. <laughs> Going around saying to each other, I'm maximum. Are you maximum? <laughs> I'm maximum. <laughs> You've grown so bitter. You are so full of contempt for good people. Well, thank you, Annie, for casting the first stone. Appreciate it, really. Oh, Lord knows I'm not perfect. Why doesn't she work on her own family? I mean, she's living down in the gatehouse with the kids. Meanwhile, up the driveway in the mansion, her husband's hold up alert for her attack. She's a remarkable woman. All these years, I don't know how I would have managed without her. But you have not done everything she's asked, Bob. When you do come to a meeting, you never re reveal your drinking. It's time. If word gets out and spreads around Akron, I will lose my practice and we're through. People know. Nobody's ever said anything to me. <laughs> Believe me, they know. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. The book of James says, faith without works is dead. Whatever's wrong with me, Annie, it ain't going to be cured by God. How will it? Maybe it won't. Maybe this is it. Maybe we'll just all have to learn to live with it. And probably not much longer either. You'd think that tattoo dancer's bad. Wait and see what shows up with no drink in me at all. I've got a demon inside me, Annie. A real live evil spirit called John Barleycorn. Can you understand that, that I've got to have it? Can you? No, I cannot. Well, thank heaven you can't. Stop trying to save me. <clears throat> Robin, next month it'll be 20 years since you carried me over that threshold into this house. 20 years. Same threshold, same house. Our children have never known you really, not like you were then. That first day, we pitched in together. We didn't take a honeymoon. We wanted to get to work together. I always thought we'd get around to a honeymoon sometime or other, but no more, Bob, no more. There'll never be a honeymoon. We've grown old, and it's a cruel thing, Bob. A cruel, cruel thing. All right, goddammit, I'll go. I'll go, and I'll talk. You happy? Well, we've waited long enough. I mean, let's have dinner without him. Right. You know, it's a miracle. Bill hasn't had a drink for four months and 18 days. Here it is, beans again. Mainly. He's a phenomenon. I'm telling you, when he talks about the mission, it just draws people to it. It's not a phenomenon. I went from supporting one grown man to supporting two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could move back to the mission. Well, it may come to that. Can I bother you? Can you bother? Remotely possible, without cutting into this charity work so much, for one of you guys to find a 
job. <laughs> Who ever thought you or I would have to worry about money? Those days were over, Abby. You really held things together, haven't you, Lois? I remember, oh, you've really done a good job. I remember that summer at the resort when you were, what, 12 or 13, and you set up that little tea room on the island there. I said to myself, one day that girl... Oh, don't say it. Yeah. We'll wind up selling blouses at Macy's. <laughs> this is not what I had in mind. And without children. Yes. I don't understand how you feel. Do you? I mean, he's not drinking anymore, but is this better? It's like he's on a crusade. We just have to have faith and hold on. We? <laughs> I'm holding on to my job. What's it that we're holding on to? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. What a day. Let's eat. Ran into a fellow I've been working on for over a month. He went out on a bender. I chased him all the way up to the Bronx. <laughs> we talked to him for about an hour. He may come to the mission, Eddie. He may come. Great, Bill. Why don't you just have a seat? Then on the uh, way back down, I stopped to consult with Doc Silkworth. Found some flowers, though, for you. Put them in the sink. Sit down. But I mean, get this. He tells me I'm on a twin engine power drive. One part genuine spirituality. One part of my old drive being number one man, he says my problem is I'm preaching to him. I'm driving him away. He says that I should just keep talking about my illness. So, what do you think, Ed? I don't know, Bill. Bill, we've been waiting for you. I mean, you think he's got something there, Ed? No, Bill, won't you sit? Sit down. Ain't great. But you know, the good doctor just doesn't see the energy of this thing, the way it's going to take off. You know, for 5,000 years, the batting average with drunks has been zero. Everyone's giving it a shot. Women's temperance, FDR, and they've all failed. I'm going to cut down to what really works. I'm going to start a chain reaction that'll reach all the drunks in the world. Well, Abby, how's that for your absolute humility? I'm going to be a little more humble than usual. <laughs> I must have talked to over 20 alcoholics today. Get this. I think I got a new one. A woman. My first woman drunk. A woman? Yeah. I talked to her for about two hours. Almost got through to her. Well, how pretty was she, Bill? Hey, I'm working. You understand? Nothing happened, okay? Two whole hours and nothing happened. How come you're so jazzed? What is this? Being casserole. Overdone. And it's all we can afford until you get a job. I have. I was waiting for the right time to surprise you. I'm investigating a tire company for a takeover. I leave in two days for Akron. Akron? Ohio? You're not ready to go to Ohio in your condition. My condition? Bill, none of us are on solid ground yet. <coughs> I checked it out with Silkworth. He says it's all right. It's only for a couple days. Wait, it's not a permanent job? And we've got to go Isn't this what you wanted? It could be something really big. They say if it comes back, I come back as president of the company. Oh, no. You know, Bill, the group's getting kind of nervous about all the drunks you've been doing it in. Yeah, tell me about it. You know, well, last night, one of them threw his shoe through the stained glass window of the church. Look, the truth is, they don't want to deal with my drunks. They think they're too low class or not trying hard enough to get your moral principle. The last thing a drunk wants to hear about is a moral principle. <laughs> Maybe Silkworth's right. You talk to a drunk about God, next thing you know, you're chasing him through the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely night. I'm going to take a walk through the promenade. I'm getting the shit beat out of me from all sides. After all this, I'm still batting zero. None of them are staying sober. Maybe it's just a great big goddamn waste of time. Well, Bill, you know, all you're talking to alcoholics, it's holding at least one of them. Oh, yeah, who's that? You.
T. Henry and Clarice for opening up their beautiful home to us for these meetings. T. Henry, would you like to give testimony now? <laughs> Fine. Thank you, Henrietta. <clears throat> now, I'd have to say that today, despite all my willpower and prayer, I can't seem to shake that gall darn self-centeredness and tune in to the access of the power which is the living God. Now that absolute honesty and absolute purity, uh, that's no big deal. But that absolute love is a real twister. Clarice and I sit every morning for a half an hour in science, silence, praying for guidance. And occasionally there is a small victory with the whippersnappers at home or at the tire factory. That's it. I'm Maximum. Are you Maximum? <laughs> T. Henry, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure we all can identify with what you shared. <laughs> All you good people have shared some things I know that have been very costly to you, so uh, I reckon I better tell you something that could cost me my profession here in Akron. <clears throat> I'm a secret drinker. I can't stop. I've sworn on the Bible hundreds of times. I quit tomorrow. Each time I'm in it, it doesn't work. I've been to sanitariums a dozen times, more. <coughs> The price to Anne and the children has been tremendous. I know that. And still, I can't stop. Oh, do you want us to pray for you? Operator, give me Poland, 868. Hello? Is this the Reverend Walter F. Tonks? Speaking? My name's Bill Wilson. I'm a stockbroker from New York. I'm in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel, and I need help. How may we help you? Well, I've been in Akron a week working on a business deal. Yesterday, the thing fell through. My partners left me to go back to New York, leaving me to pick up the pieces. It's a colossal disappointment. Would I'm a drinker, and I keep getting pulled towards the bar. Well, I need to talk to another drunk, so I went to the church directory, and I picked out your name. <laughs> How did you come to be in touch with us? Uh, was it because we're Episcopalian? Are you Episcopal? No, alcoholic. <laughs> and you think I'm a drunk? No, I thought you'd give me the name of a drunk. I'm not crazy. Okay, 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 okay. Do you have a pencil? Yeah. All right. I believe I have a few names of some people that might be able to help.
Operator, get me pulling 527. Johnson residence. I'm looking for Stretch Johnson. So am I. When you find him, tell him to call. <laughs> Operator, give me two eight one. Oh, is Frank Sullivan there? Yeah, is him. Frank, my name's Bill. I'm from New York. I'm, I'm an alcoholic. I need to talk. I go to hell. <laughs> Same to you, pal. Operator 244. Shit. <sighs> Operator 648. Hello. Norman Shepard? Yes. Norman, my name's Bill. I got your number from Walter Tunks. Yeah? I'm in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel and I need help. This is gonna sound really strange. Norman? Yeah? Well, I've been on the wagon for five months and I'm about to slip off and that would be suicide. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it would, Mr. Wilson, but how can I help? Well, you're not a drinker, are you? No. Can you give me the name of one? I'm uh, just getting ready to get on the Zephyr for New York. Didn't Reverend Tunks give you yeah. any other names? Yeah, he gave me ten and you're the tenth. Hey. Aren't there any drunks in Akron? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You call Henrietta Cyberling. She's at 522. She belongs to some organization, uh, Oxford something or another, very religious. Cyberling? Yeah. Well, I any relation to Frank Cyberling, the president of Goodyear? I just met him. I could never call his wife. No, not his wife. This is his daughter-in-law. She's a 522. You call her. Five two two. Cyberling? Yes, this is she. Henrietta, my name's Bill. I'm with the Oxford Group. Henrietta, I'm, I'm from New York, and well, this... I'm about to slip off the wagon. I'm a drinking man. I need to talk to another drunk. Oh, well, um, are you sober right now? Yeah, I've been sober for five months, oh, but... Oh, good for you! <laughs> well, thanks, but I'm staring at the bar, and it looks mighty appealing. Well, I uh, gotta talk to another drinking man. Uh, oh, um, this really is manna from heaven. <laughs> oh, hello, hello, please don't hang up. I'm right here, Bill. I know just the man for you. Listen, you march down that main stairway, hail a cab, and come right out here. Tell the taxi driver to drop you at Stan Hewitt Hall. Stan Hewitt, Hewitt, who's that? Well, that's <laughs> Welsh for rock is found here. <laughs> okay, it looks like I'm on my way. Man named Bill. I'm a 
afraid this isn't the time. Stop. Bob. Go back. Go back out at once. Happy Mother's Day. Mother's Day is tomorrow. Anne? Anne, are you there, Anne? I'm afraid he's too drunk to drive. Happy well, Mother's Day. you must drive him. <laughs> Incoherent. Oh, well, how incoherent is he? <laughs> totally. He shan't be in any shape till late tomorrow at best. Well, then bring him tomorrow at five. I'll try. Happy day, honey. I love you. Robert, you are a contemptible man. Yeah. You are never again going to humiliate me in front of my friends or my children. You're no doctor. You haven't been a husband or a father for years. You're a weak, pathetic salt. I'd like you to introduce you to Bob Smith and his wife, Anne. Pleased to meet you. I'm afraid we can only stay about 15 minutes. 15 minutes tops. <laughs> Looks like you could use a drink. Oh. Yeah, maybe I could. <laughs> Town. Uh, St. Johnsbury. They still have that trucking outfit up there? I wouldn't know. I'm from East Dorset. It's a small village outside of Manchester, Manchester. Vermont. Hey. Well, that is quite a coincidence. Hmm. I'm a real nasty drunk. Been sober five months and one day today. Last night I was knocking around the Mayflower Hotel, alone, about to take a drink. Oh, we got 12 minutes. I'll give you the Reader's Digest condensed version. You game? Fire away. Where to begin? Oh. 1918. I was waiting to go off the war bivouacked in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The rich families up there insisted on entertaining us soldiers. And, you know, I'd sit at these formal dinners and I could hardly speak. Then one night, a pretty girl handed me a Bronx cocktail. And then another, and then another. Well, and then the miracle happened, you know? It was like, that strange barrier between me and all those men and women seemed to go down. It was like I belonged to life. Hell, to the universe. I got plastered that first night. Passed out, in fact. Doc, the story of Fallen takes me from the highest peak of the financial game right down to the gutter. Funked out of law school. I flew an airplane jump from Albany to Manchester. Hiding booze, stealing from my wife, lies, jails, hospitals. How old are you? <laughs> 39. 55. I got 16 years on you. Keep firing. <laughs> so I ended up at the hospital, and well, my doctor tells me that the alcoholic allergy is a disease, so I figure, you know. A, a, a medical disease? Yeah. A disease. Sign. Symptoms, cause, progression. What? 
What? Implying what? A, a treatment? Makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, medically? Yes. Yes, it does. Why couldn't I see that? Most doctors can't. So I figured this is it. Self-knowledge, right? Didn't work. <coughs> Next piece of the puzzle is, well, don't fall out of your chair. Call it spiritual. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One afternoon, an old buddy of mine, hard drinker named Abby, shows up. So, with a message for me from Dr. Carl Young. Abby had joined the Oxford group. Oxford? <laughs> Wife and I have been going to those damn meetings for years. Yeah, well, Abby tells me it's not all about willpower. He said you could have all the willpower in the world, it wouldn't be enough. He said that I had to make a surrender to God or whatever. I oh, please. I know, I know. I got pretty cynical about things like that too. But I tried it. I went to meetings, but I was still getting loaded. Well, one day back in the hospital, something else happened. But in the interest of time, no, 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 go on. Well, let's just say I had kind of a flash. And, well, I haven't had a drink since. What, you, you talking about like a conversion experience? You've read William James. Mm-hmm, I have. The sway of alcohol over mankind is unquestionably due to its power to stimulate the mystical faculties of human nature, usually crushed to earth by the cold facts and dry criticisms of the sober hour. Buddy, I have read everything I thought I might help. Even read that crazy son of a bitch Freud. <laughs> For the longest time, he really loused me up, told me it was all in my toilet training. <laughs> Keep talking. Well, so then what did I do? I, I went out and I tried to convert all the drunks in New York City. How many did I get? None. Not one. Doc, all this time something's been missing. In that hotel lobby yesterday, I knew doctors, preachers, my wife, my friends, none of them could help me. Why not? Because they're not drunks. They don't know what it's like to wake up your head bloody, a golf bag in your arms, a woman standing over you who maybe is your wife, maybe not. <laughs> the veins in your temples pounding on bone. God, they don't, oh. they don't know what it's like. Every cell in your body dry as sand, thirsting for the one thing in the world you know will destroy you. I do. Do now, I ever? Now, Doc, I, I don't want to get too far out of here. I mean, we're both men of the world, rational men, sensible men. Lived through a great war. But I mean, maybe there's a reason I'm sitting here with you. In that hotel lobby yesterday, I knew. I knew in my guts, like a man knows he's going to die, that to stay out of that bar, I needed help. And then I realized what I needed was another drunk to talk to, just as much as he needed me. Friend, I need your help. Uh, how can I help? I think you just have. Hmm. Um, we're out of time, but thank you. No, no, what's your rush? We can take a little more time. All right. Well, I... I'm listening. Oh. Oh, well. Um, what, what you said without all the horse manure thrown in there. <laughs> it was like listening to myself. You know, I've done all that, all of it. Splunked out of med school twice. My father, the judge, coming all the way to Chicago with the town doctor, the two of me, dragging me back to Vermont. That wonderful old doc, I chose medicine because that doc and uh, the last person in the world I wanted to disappoint. I was 32 when I finally got my degree. Hell, it took me 17 years to marry Annie. My whole life's been slowed down. I, Bill, you've lived three lives. I've barely lived one. You heard the expression when hell freezes over? Sure have. I'm barely moving anymore. I use booze and pills every day. I mean, I wake up in the morning with the jitters and I gotta take sedatives to calm my hands for surgery. I'm drinking again by the afternoon. 
I gotta be drunk to get to sleep. I am flat ass terrified of not being able to sleep. I, sometimes in surgery, I'm high as a kite. Lucky I haven't killed anybody. I do butt surgery, man. <laughs> First thing you can do to a drunk is pass a law trying to stop him. He gets very serious about it then. Oh, yeah. You know, and Bill, I have tried to believe. I've tried my best, but I have sworn off God. The lid's on tight. Maybe we should just leave God out of it for now. I want to hear about you and booze. If I don't drink, I'm a monster. I mean, booze is the glue that holds me together. It's all, it's the only thing I can count on. But now the goddamn stuff doesn't even work anymore. With or without it, I'm a monster. The monster is our disease. You really believe that, Bill? Christ, I just, I just figured that a drug was a bum under the bridge. Not folks like us. Look, I'm a physician. Sometimes I get to wishing I could be a drunk under the bridge. But what you're saying was what I needed all along was just to come clean with one hardcore nose in the gutter drunk. You found it, Bob. Fire away. Well, yeah, well, 1898, I left home for Dartmouth College. I'll never forget that feeling. Finally, I was free. You know, I always just wanted to play the piano and tap dance and have curly hair. And when I was loaded, I could play the piano and I tried to tap dance and Christ for all I know I had curly hair, you know? <laughs> Okay, 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 Henrietta, we know it's been six hours. <laughs> really, we'll be right there. Thanks, Bill. Hey, you know, all of our lives, we've had people try to tell us what's wrong with us. That just gets our backs up, makes us want to dig in our heels. They can't fix us with that. No, they can't. But, Smitty, telling our own stories to each other, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, being honest about it, about who we are and what's happened to us, that's real. It has the ring of truth to it. And maybe when we're telling it, something true makes its way across that gap between one drunk and another, like sound waves or light rays. And maybe when no one's looking, it slips in under the ribs and hits the other fellow's heart. Yeah, well, you're getting kind of complicated about all this Abercrombie, but all the fireworks and magic thrown in. And... Look, I can see the shape of this whole thing emerging. You know, if this treatment of yours really works, we've got no choice but to try it on others. Weave? Don't worry, I'll go easy on the fireworks. Hell, maybe the main thing about that flash of mine was just to move me along to this meeting with you. If there's any such thing as a miracle, partner, uh, this is it. I don't know about anything about those things, but you know, it sounds like it's not religion after all. Just other drunks. And maybe, just maybe something else working through us. We'll say hundred, thousand. We'll say millions. Let's just... Get one more. <laughs> oh my God. I know he's worse than I thought. Give me a hand. Oh, oh, I drink for Christ's sakes. I drink. Oh, drink. Jesus, what happened? How could you do this to us? Drink. Right, I'll get you a hooker, Scott. Yeah. What? Are you crazy? He needs it. I need it. I need it. The man's about to have a seizure. It's dangerous. <laughs> I agreed to let you live with us, but leaving bottles out in the open? Bob used to learn to live with temptation. What a harebrained idea that was. The man's about to have a seizure. A seizure could kill him. A treat for Christ's sakes. I'm throwing this out. No! He's got the shakes, babe. we got to bring him down gradually. Please. I knew it was absurd to let a man just two weeks sober go off to a medical convention <coughs> all the way to New Jersey for five days and with other doctors. Okay. Why ever did I listen to you? All right, all right. I made a mistake, but... You he... said this was working, and this may be as bad as I've ever seen him. Okay, I was wrong, but he needs... To... I know what he needs. He needs another trip to the sanitarium. No, no, I, I got... I gotta op operate Monday at nine. What? That gives us three whole days. Three days? It'll take three weeks to dry him out. Come on. I'll be getting back in 
the hall. Bop. Bop. Shh. Whisper. Yes. <laughs> if I'm not there Monday. Impossible. I'm... Maybe not. Let me take care of it. I'll use the town's treatment. After all you've done, you have the nerve to talk about another treatment? I know, I know. But I've done it myself a lot of times. We build you up the Cairo cords here for energy, cold tomatoes for vitamins, and taper you off with, well, alcohol and sediments. <laughs> you gotta bring it down gradually, and booze and a stash of pills is all we have. That's right. I should trust you again? Let him try. I'm begging you. Let him and me try. Phil, you're a man who can talk a dog off of a meat wagon. <laughs> Here you go, Smitty. So where do you keep your sedatives? Sedatives? The goofballs? The pills you told me about? Shh. I can't remember. Last thing I remember was born in the 20th century. <laughs> well, if it comes back to you, let me know. Start you off with the cold tomatoes. No, not the goddamn tomatoes. I hate tomatoes. <laughs> You'll hate them more when this is over. No, 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 not yet. I can't. I can't. <sighs> All right, we'll start you off with the Cairo syrup. Okay, yeah. Uh, Open up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> been the story of my life. I'll never make this up to you. You're not eating your tomatoes. Socks. Socks? In my socks. What's in your socks? The goofballs. <laughs> the goofballs? They're upstairs. In my sock drawer. In my socks. <laughs> too shaky to grasp the steering wheel, and we placed a scalpel in those hands. Yeah, I was worried about him too. But treating a drunk with the shakes is tricky. You gotta sedate him enough to kill the shakes, but stop before you kill the drunk. Bill! What was that you gave him in the parking lot? What? Bill. I figured he needed a little fine tuning is all. What did you give him? One more goofball and that last bottle of beer. He seemed about right though. He perked right up, didn't he? <laughs> I wouldn't call it perk, no. He was walking straight. Well, pretty straight. By the time he finally got to the main entrance. Not like he can walk. And where is he now? When he called, he said he'd be right home, and that's been four hours. It'd be just like him to go out celebrating and ruin it all. 
No, I don't think that's it. You're such an optimist. At my best, yes. Real moxie, you. All these years, I've clung to my faith. I've clung to my Bible, sometimes literally. But I lost all hope for him. It just doesn't take much to tip me over anymore. You know, Bob courted me for many years, and I wouldn't marry him until he ceased drinking, and for a year he did. That's when we married. I had such hope then. And now? Perhaps. <laughs> Those first two weeks when you arrived, that's the longest stretch he's been sober these 20 years. That's why I didn't want you to send him off to that convention. You know what it was like for me to sit and wait those five days. So many nights I'd sit here alone, the children asleep. The house is still as death, but for the clock ticking. Sitting with the feeling of hope and dread as the cars came up and then passed by. I know all about dread. Do you know about waiting for someone? To come home? To come alive. Waiting for someone else, someone you love, to come alive. I, no, I, I can't say that I do. To be honest with you, Bill, I don't think you can know. But your wife probably could. Is she coming out here? Yeah, I, I hope so. You've been apart for such a long time. I can't help wondering what she thinks of all this. Yeah, hard to tell. I think it's time for her to come for a visit. Perhaps I'll write to her myself? Yeah, yeah. Listen. Patient's okay, too. <laughs> Where have you been? It's the strangest thing. I've been driving all over Akron, looking up every person I've harmed. All our creditors, people I've been avoiding, some for years. Told them exactly what's going on. Expressed my wish to make amends. Even went to Hubert to have the mortgage bank. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, this is it. I, I've had enough. By tomorrow morning, everybody in Akron's gonna know. But I told Bill, remember? I told you I'd do whatever it takes, no matter what. And I guess this is it. I'm sorry it took so long, Ann. Th th you know, this could be our, our ruin, but so be it. I'm really sorry it took so long. I guess that just shows how much harm I've done. There is one more amends I have to make. Anne, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the pain that I've caused you. From now on, I'll let my actions speak for me. Showing you a man who's a husband and a father and and I'm searching to. I best get dinner. If there's even one tomato involved, I'll scream. <laughs> Slimy red recalcitrant bastard. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. And so, Lois, 
hard to believe it's been two months since I moved in with Bob and Ann. Each morning we sit in silence asking for guidance. Most nights Bob and I are up till two or three in the morning drinking coffee, trying to develop our program. Bob says this could just be a fluke unless we prove it with others. So we're off to work on our first case. Another surgeon? Remind me never to have my appendix out in Akron. You know what I think, Lloyd? What? I think we need another drink. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> hey, hey, Bob. <laughs> I'm on a roll here tonight. Don't mess me up. Now, you said the other night when we came over and told you our stories, you said you would make a surrender. In front of my wife? What the hell else was I going to say? They're talking about you out at the hospital, Lloyd. Yeah, well, they were talking about you too, Bob, when you were drinking. Now they're talking about you sober. I don't give a good goddamn about any of it. Just leave me alone. We can't leave you alone, Lloyd. Hey, buddy, you don't know shit from Shinola about me. Every time I turn around the last three days, it's the Temperance Twins selling salvation. <laughs> <laughs> you got half a mind to nail you, Mr. Big Shot. Stop, bro, girl. No, don't, don't, don't. Come on. All right. All right. Okay. It's all right. Bob. You know what I think? What, boy? There's your drink. <laughs> Have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, we ran into a slight snag with Lloyd. <laughs> but we are learning to never try to work with drunks in bars. We've got a perfect prospect now, a young fellow named Eddie. He's connected to all the best circles in Akron. So if we get him, we're in. He, his wife Ruthie, and the two little kids moved in with us. We tapered Eddie down with tomatoes, but then he tried to commit suicide? When we got him back, he got angry at a tuna fish sandwich and then threatened Anne with a knife. So we locked him up down in the coal cellar and started our treatment again. I do wish you'd come here on your vacation, darling. It must be hard for you alone to manage the finances, but somehow I know that will all take care of itself. Dear Bill, I'm very disappointed you're not coming home. There are no finances to manage and nothing will take care of itself. <coughs> If you don't bring in some money soon, we'll lose Father's house. I'm still not clear what happened with the business deal. Anne wrote me, inviting me to come. I don't know whether to join you or not. I feel quite lonely, but my life is here. And so, Ruthie. While I, your husband, was in the hospital, you were off at this Oxford something or other. Just, just like every Wednesday night for the past month, Eddie. There's yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So, so at this meeting, what exactly did you say? I, I made a surrender. <laughs> God, it's it's hot in here. I'm gonna go down and get some milk. Mil okay. Milk, <laughs> milk, milk. You never drink milk. <laughs> what else did you tell them? Did you tell them about me? No, I spoke about myself. Did you speak of our conjugal life? No, Eddie, why are you so mad? 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 I, I, you think I'm mad? No, 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 no. okay in there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought we heard a commotion up here. Yeah, we're having a little trouble sleeping. You sleep with your clothes on now, Eddie? I don't sleep much at all anymore. This treatment of yours is for shit. Well, maybe it's just you, pal. Yeah? Uh, Eddie, we think it's best that you and Ruthie are separated tonight. You're out in the garage. Go, march. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> what happened, Ruthie? Are you all right, dear? Maybe he's too much for us to handle. We got to sell him on this thing. Damn it, if we get somebody like him, this thing will take off. Maybe the only way to sell him is to stop trying so hard to sell it. Oh, you, there's something wrong with me. I'm off here. No, 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 no. Uh, what, I, what I was trying to say was, never mind. So it's me. I'm the problem. <laughs> Maybe we just have to, we can't let what we want get in the way of reality anymore. You're saying there's something wrong with me. <laughs> yeah, you and your goddamn ego the size of the Chrysler building. Oh, oh God. No, oh, that's just great. Oh. That's really great. Uh, Ruthie, I'm sorry, we didn't understand uh, earlier. Bill, this situation requires more than we can provide here. With Ruthie's permission, I think it's time you place a call to Ypsilanti. What's Ypsilanti? It's State Asylum, Michigan. Is that all right with you, Ruthie? Uh, fine. I'll, I'll take the children to my parents in Ann Arbor. Thank you for trying. He could have killed her. What the hell are we doing? This isn't working. Bill, it is working. What? Eddie is doing us a favor. Huh? He's keeping us sober. Hell, a fellow like Eddie could keep the whole army sober. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Well, do me a favor. Thank Eddie for me, will you? It's great to see you, baby. Is it new? It's, no, it's old and mended. I know the feeling. Well, I'm glad you've come. You look terrific. Um, shall we go? What's the matter? <coughs> we'll get to it. No, come on. What is it? Well, well Macy's gave me the whole week off. But I'm not sure how long I'm going to be staying. What do you mean? What are you saying? On the train. Look, I know how, how strange this all must seem. Even I have my doubts. Strange. What you're doing here, Bill, sounds completely insane. I know. Remember that fella Eddie I wrote you about? Yes. Sent him to a lunatic asylum. Split up the family, the whole nine yards. So it's still just you and this Bob? Come on, let's go. They're dying to meet you. Wait. What about the business work thing? What is this? I need to be clear about these things. OK, it's dead. I failed. I see. And you're still not ready to come home? I can't yet. No. You can't. All right. Oh, Bill, I've got some bad news. I didn't want to tell you in a letter. I wanted to tell you face to face. It's Abby. He's drinking again. He's been drunk for two weeks. What, Eddie? No. Yes, that's why I thought maybe we should go home tomorrow. Oh, but for now, take me to the Smiths. Lois. You must be Mrs. Smith. So good to meet you. Thank you. This is my husband, Robert. Call me Bob. Everybody else does if I'm lucky. <laughs> oh, I appreciate you taking Bill into your home. Well, pleasure's ours, mostly. <laughs> Hello there, William. She wants me to come home. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to butt in, but in my view, your husband's a very unusual man. <laughs> He's got real vision. I mean, that's rare to find. 
Not much patience, mind you, but a great deal of vision. Thanks a million. You're welcome. You see, Lois, when I hit rock bottom, he picked me up and he carried me through to the other side. He cared for me. With all of his talk, now that he's sober, I think you can believe what he says. You see, Bill always wants more, and he's got to sell for less. I always want less, I've got to sell for more. <laughs> but if he says that something new could be happening here, I myself tend to give him the benefit of the doubt. I might add, Lois. For a Vermont native to say such a thing, that's how I praise. Oh, I appreciate your saying that. I really do, very much. But you have to understand, I signed on with him a long time before you did, for reasons which at this very moment are not crystal clear to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, dear. But the men are, are so... Thank the Lord. That's an actual fact. You must be tired. Perhaps we'll put you in your own room. It overlooks the garden. It's quiet and gets the morning sun. That's very kind of you, and I think that should be best for now. Good afternoon, ladies. I need some fresh air. I'm going to go out for a walk. Bill? Walk? I'm planning on getting out of that chair anytime, William. Soon? Maybe, maybe not. I haven't been able to get in my chair for two days now. <laughs> you know, if you think about trying to set a new world record, you ought to know I used to live in that chair, lying in the exact same direction, right, Annie? Head toward Mount Peace Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go back upstairs and go to bed. Hey, Bill, I've been thinking about where we've been going wrong. You know what we need? We need a better supply of more reliable alcoholics. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Ones that are already in the hospital. They have always have a good batch down there at Akron City. What say, Bill? You gay? You got any more bright ideas? <laughs> do you know anybody down at the hospital? As a matter of fact, I do. <clears throat> and I think if, if we call down there, we could, we could probably get somebody to, uh, you know, they probably got a good, bright-eyed, ready-to-go drunk, ready for us to work on. <laughs> <laughs> well, We're glad you're staying. It's like the, maybe Lois is right. It's time to go home. You can't do that, Bill. The hell I can't. I'd be on the next train tomorrow to New York. You're headed for a drink if you do, Abercrombie. Don't call me Abercrombie. You're still headed for a drink. <laughs> what do you know? That I know. The old Bill going down would try to drink himself out of it. Oh, but the new Bill, feeling like shit, has this great opportunity of going under sober. Who Hallelujah. Who asked you how you feel, Bill? That's the most boneheaded thing I've ever heard. Bill, feelings ain't facts. Just because your ego took one big beating doesn't mean the world's coming to an end. And whoever said it was going to be easy staying sober? Nope. I'm sick and tired of your two-bit Midwestern philosophy. Yeah, well, your red-hot New York wits wearing a little thing on me like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
man, this man is insufferable. Why'd you even marry him? <laughs> Insufferability was high on my list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like the one about the policeman shining his light on the couple making love in the park. It's okay, officer. We're married. Oh, sorry, says the cop. I didn't realize she was your wife. Neither did I, says the fellow, until you shined your light on us. <laughs> and what the hell is that supposed to mean? It means that we can't let our treatment rely on blinding flashes of light. We've got to get back to basics, like the rest of medicine. You know, the human body, nature, putting the pieces together, like step by step, until one day the familiar is right there in front of you. Get it? Yeah, Akron City Hospital, please. I know the admitting nurse down there. I'll bet she's got a nice, neat, well-behaved drug just dying for a while. <laughs> yeah, Nurse Hall, yeah. Uh, Dr. Bob Smith here. Say, a fellow from New York and I, we found a cure for alcoholism and, and we need, that's right, a cure for alcohol. Yes, as a matter of fact, I have tried it on myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, you got any drunks we can work on down there? He punched you in the eye, and you knocked him out. Nice going, Hilda. <laughs> Say, what kind of a bird is this egg when he's sober? <laughs> a grand chap, a lawyer. And his wife's a peach, too. <laughs> well, good. My partner and I will be down there tomorrow. Yeah, thanks. Bye now. You hear that, Sir William? <laughs> hey, Sir William, this one sounds perfect. May I make a suggestion? Talk to his wife first. <laughs> Are you sure you're leaving? Yes. You think this is crazy, don't you? I think I want you to come home. You think? You're not sure. Bill, you hardly talked to me for three days. You're in your own little world. If I go back to the city before I have something that works, I'm dead. Is this working? <coughs> the tide's gone out, and I'm staring at a lot of wreckage, and without booze, it's a hell of a lot worse. <coughs> I'm dying for a drink. Bob looks solid, but believe me, he could take a drink any second. This thing has got to be greater than just the two of us. I see. Well, maybe your hope is here. But I'm trying to hang on to life in New York. I've crossed a line, but I don't know where the hell I'm going. Please, Lo, stay. Why should I? Because we've always made these crossings together. No, 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 we have not. What do you mean? Do you really want to know? Yes, I'm listening. Somewhere along the way, I found myself alone and, and helpless over you. <laughs> I knew you had these terrible losses in your life, though I thought I could make up for them, and I have found that I cannot. And when you're alone, you have choices. You stay or you leave. Resentment or understanding. These choices must be made. <clears throat> I chose to stay and try to find meaning. And one day, I noticed that my loneliness had turned to solitude. I may not have the life that I imagined, but I'm learning to live the life that I have. I have. Noticing things like, like someone else's child smiling up at me. I know what that's like. Do you? Do you know what it's like for me? Have you ever even asked me? I am trying to find my own way in this whirlwind of you. And even now, I don't think that you can know what it's like to love someone day after day, night after night, who's not there, who's not really there. I'm so sorry. I've let you down so badly. I've missed you coming alive. I'm so sorry. time Billy's been in this hospital in the past six months. I've had it. I mean, I really have had it. <sighs> How much
much does this program of yours cost? Nothing. You on the level? But we can't do it without your help. I'll tell you something. I did something this time I've never done before. I went to our preacher and I said, you're not reaching him. I'm going to find someone who can if I have to search all Akron. I prayed for that. And then you two show up. Well, God sure does have some sense of humor. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, but we're just trying to keep from taking a drink ourselves. Oh, my, pardon me, but that sounds a little bit strange. I mean, I've been praying for someone to help him. Bill, is there anything you want to throw in? No? Please, ma'am, please. Well, okay. I'll tell him you're here. Thank you. Bill, honey, I've been talking to a couple of men about your drinking. I resent that, my wife talking to strangers. Don't worry, they're drunks, just like you. <laughs> One of them's a doctor. A drunk doctor? Well, ain't that the cat's balls? Shh! Christ, it hot! Shh, shh! Listen, these fellas want to talk with you. They say it's going to help them stay sober. Help them? Oh, that's rich. How much this one going to cost? They won't take money. They're more than a little strange. No fooling. Sure tell them to come by sometime next week. Uh-uh. They're waiting outside. I'll tell them you're here. Oh. Okay. Go on in. Thank you, ma'am. Here, take this, ma'am. Thank you. You ready, Bill? Hello there. I'm Bob Smith. This is Bill Wilson. Yeah, which one of you is the drunk doctor? Uh, that'd be me. My, my friend here, he's a drunk stockbroker. Oh, boy. I'm Bill Dotson. They call me Billy. I heard you gave Nurse Hall a black eye the other night. So they say. I don't recollect it myself. Yeah, well, we drunks do terrible things in blackouts, don't we, Bill? <laughs> Woke up one morning in a jail cell not knowing what country I was in. <laughs> Didn't look like America. I guess Canada, but it turned out to be Cuba. Yeah. <laughs> I know all about that, not that I've ever been to Cuba. I don't think I have anyway. Billy, I got to hiding bottles from my wife and then not knowing where I could find them. And, you know, over door jams. Down the clothes chute. Coal bin. <clears throat> ash container of the furnace. Water tank of the toilet. Doghouse. <laughs> I myself got to hiding 10 four-ounce bottles in my socks until one day the wife and kids go to see the, no, what is it, Tugboat Annie at the pictures. Wallace Beery used the same hiding place. They came home, dove straight for my socks. It was humiliating. I know all about that. I've been in there so many times tied to this bed for two, three days before I ever knew where I was. I reckon in this pitiful life, it's time to piss on the fire and call in the dogs. What got you to this point, Billy? You think I know? I come from a good farm family in Carlisle County, Kentucky. One day I was eight years old. I was helping the hired hands clear out a barn. I started in on some hard cider from a barrel, passed out, mm -hmm. had to be carried into the house. Next morning I felt like shit. <laughs> I woke up, you know what I did? Made a beeline for the barrel in the barn. It was love. <laughs> <laughs> so I joined the United States Army. I got paid to drink. <laughs> got married, nice house, nice kids, Akron, Law School, Akron City Council, but the last few years, it's just gone all to hell. All to hell with it. What do you think, Bill? Maybe. Good. Son, we feel like we've been given a gift. <clears throat> it's the gift of sobriety. Now, it's a strange sort of gift because in order to keep it, we got to pass it on. Yeah, well, nobody's given me any gifts lately. You have a disease. A disease? That's right. It's called alcoholism. You're shitting me. It's an incurable disease. Well, how'd I get it? I don't know. We think we may have been born with it. Say, so would you tell that to the wife? I'd be happy to. But we think we might have a treatment. You see, we believe 
by taking it to someone else who needs it and wants it that we can stay sober. Now, if you don't want it, just say so and we'll be no, gone. No, I, I'd like to quit for, you know, two, three, maybe five <laughs> months till I get oh. things straightened out. <laughs> no. no. What, what's the fun <clears throat> about that? Billy, it doesn't matter whether you stay sober for five days, five months, or five years. If you start again, you'll just wind up right back here, tied down six ways from Sunday. Billy, could you leave this hospital and never take another drink? Never? I thought you guys knew what you were talking about. Never. <laughs> for, oh, forget never. Yeah. Even we can't promise that anymore. No, no, no. Billy, can you just make it through today? Today? I can't even get out of this bed today. You, you don't understand. I'm afraid to leave this hospital at all. We do understand that, friend, but... Is there anything outside of yourself you can believe in or rely on? Oh, you don't have to sell me on religion. I used to be a deacon at our church. I taught Sunday school for years. Prayer don't work. I still believe in God. I reckon God quit believing in me. Uh, I doubt that, son. Well, you lick this thing. How'd you do it? Well, see, we've chiseled this thing down. And what we found is right at the heart of us all, you have to make a... Hold on, partner. What he asked, I'm telling him. Telling him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You see, what my partner was about to say is that we're no better than you, Billy. Mm -hmm. No worse. Maybe just a little farther along. Just two bozos on a bus making room for a third. I mean, we'll help you try to find your way. And that's a promise. Mm. Thank you kindly for that. So, Billy, are you ready to join us and let go of booze entirely? Entirely. And join us. Entirely? <laughs> No, 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 not, not entirely. That was your statement. That's what you said. That's hold on, hold on. Maybe we're putting the cart before the... Billy, are you willing to ask for help? No, I can't say I could do that. But no. you said... No! Uh, well, I guess you just need some time to think on it. No, I don't need to think on it. God damn it, leave me alone. Don't waste your time on me. Okay, okay, we're going. Billy, we'll be back tomorrow. What was that about? Can you feel that? Feel what? The three of us, like, held together there just for a moment. Like three birds held still in a pocket of wind. <laughs> Fireworks and magic, eh, Abercrombie? Yes, You're back. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. These days? Yes. I've never seen two men so absorbed. Do you begin to worry? Yes, I do. But seeing him here with Bob, it does seem that something different is taking hold. It's, it's quite shocking, actually. Wow, to hear you say that, well, it's a real treasure. It helps me very much. Well, that's good. I mean, I, I'm glad. So many nights, I'd sit here with the main thing on my mind being whether to leave him or not. Well, why did you stay? I loved the man I used to know. I couldn't bear to think of him alone. Does that sound cowardly? Hardly. There's virtue in staying, too. There is, yes. There used to be hardly a day go by without my being angry with Bob. And then one evening when Bill and I were here waiting for him, I felt like I saw Bob's sickness ever so clearly from close up and far away. I saw two ordinary people caught up in something terrible, yes. But nobody's fault, really. I let go. It helped me to be more forgiving. 
I wish I had your generosity. Sometimes I feel like it's my anger that all that's keeping me going. You don't see you so much as angry, dear, or spunky. <laughs> really? Yes, you're a strong person when it comes to something you believe in. Yes, I suppose I am. Hello? Come in. Hello, I'm um, Han, Billy Dotson's wife, and um, I, are you Mrs. Ann Smith? Yes, and this is Mrs. Wilson. Oh, nice to meet you. you. And you? I, I was told to come over here. Who told you, dear? Dr. Smith. He's working on my husband, and he told me to come on over. I told him that I was boiling peaches. Tonight, in this heat, boiling peaches. And Dr. Bob says to me, Han, which is more important, the peaches or your husband? And I had to say, the peaches. <laughs> Hey, wake up, Billy. How'd you sleep? Well, I didn't think I slept a wink, but I guess I did. So, Billy, what's it to be? Well, I'll tell you. Yeah, let me see. You know, when you boys left last night, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about what liquor had done to me and my family. Scum. I am scum. Y'all know what that feels like? Yes, we do. We sure do, Billy. I wanted to ask for help like you said I had to, but the truth is, I, I could not. No. Oh, well. No, hey, hold on, hold on. I ain't finished yet. 
Say, would you mind if I got up and we all sat down together like on the same level? Of course not, Billy. <clears throat> Dude, oh, look, here, let's help. You know, oh, let's, Christ, I am weak. Let's, let's sit up here in the middle. Bring on the tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. <clears throat> well, there I was stuck for the longest time. I was stuck for the longest time. And I kept thinking about when you boys come back in my room last night, and you were standing there like you saw something in me. Well, it's like when you pass a good card game and you want in. Boys, I wanted in. Exactly. Keep and talking, Billy. I felt like I'd do anything to be there with you. And, and almost in spite of myself, I found myself saying out loud, if they can do it, I can do it. If they can do it, I can do it over and over again. Hmm. And then I found something break free. Yes. Yes. Well, all at once, I knew I could. It was like things came clear, like a breeze was blowing, like on a farm, on a summer's day, when you can actually see that breeze ruffling the wheat. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, that's a beautiful sight. Beautiful. Bob, this is it. So, are you ready to join us, Billy, and ask for help? <laughs> yes, friends, I am. And so Dr. Bob and I walked out of Billy D's room that day and one of us turned to the other and said, well, now we have three members. That makes us a group. Billy D left that hospital a free man. And we three went out looking for just one more to pass it on. To pass it on. You know, even today, I feel like I could knock off a couple scotches, but I just say to myself, Better get back on the job, big boy. Go down and see some of the drunks in the ward. Given of ourselves, of our own effort, and strength, and time. That's what Bill W. learned in New York City and what I learned from Bill. But it takes practice, you know, to learn that spirit of service. For you newcomers, a couple of suggestions. Take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. Just sit and listen. Do as each of us does. Don't drink, go to meetings, and ask for help. You know, every time I'm at a meeting, I'm brought back to the very first meeting where Bill W. came into my life. Bill's a man who became like a brother to me. Strange, some reason, all evening long, he's been very much on my mind. But I reckon it's the same for each of you. Each meeting's like the first, an act of faith, drawing us together through an invisible thread that connects us all. I'd like to close our meeting with a moment of silence. Let me close with a word about Dr. Bob. One Sunday in November 1950, I traveled again to Akron to ask Bob whether he and I should turn over the governing of the fellowship to its members. Radical idea at the time. Bob was in terrible shape, deathly ill. After careful thought, he said, well, Sir William, it has to be AA's decision, not yours or mine. It's fine with me. A few hours later, I took my leave of Dr. Bob, knowing that the following week, he was to undergo a very serious operation. <clears throat> Neither of us dared to say what was in our hearts. As I went down the steps, I turned to look back. And there stood Bob in the doorway there, tall and upright as ever. Some color had come back into his cheeks. He was carefully dressed in a light brown suit. This was my partner, a man with whom I had never had a hard word. And then that wonderful smile lit up his face. 
He said, remember, Bill, let's not louse this thing up. Let's keep it simple. That was the last time I ever saw him. I'd like to end our meeting with a moment of silence.